Yes, so I'd like to introduce Mark Reynolds from Mace. Those who haven't been on the call for the last 10 minutes. Um, welcome. I think we're very lucky to have you talk to us this afternoon. And thank you, Mark, once again for coming to talk to us. I think your presentation is about 20 minutes, and then perhaps we can have 10 minutes of questions before you rush off. Yeah. yeah. To, uh, if you need me a bit longer, I've, I've got a bit more time. But um, uh, Richard, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for the opportunity. Uh, as it says on the slides, I'm Mark Reynolds, and I'm the Group Chairman and Chief Executive of MACE. Uh, hopefully you know what we do. Uh, if you don't, we are a consulting construction organisation, uh, predominantly, and uh, we also have a small development arm and a reasonably sized uh, FM business. Uh, I'm also involved with the Construction Leadership Council, have been for four years, and I've been looking after the uh, skills, people and skills group, as we now call it. And uh, I'm also involved with uh, a government the multi-government team led by DfE and Bayes that looks after what they call Project Speed Construction Skills Delivery Group, uh, which actually has been really helpful. So uh, today I just want to take you through some of the industry forecasts where we see things going at the macro scale. Uh, I'll draw that down into London South East, a bit of detail for you that might be helpful. Um, be worthwhile giving you a summary of what the government are doing with their policy interventions and how we're influencing that and how they're supporting us. Uh, and then a piece around what we've been doing with the People of Skills Industry Plan, which we produced last January and actually had a workshop updating it yesterday uh, and where we see that going forward over the next 12 months. Uh, and then really a bit of a call to action for anyone on this call. Um, just to give you a bit of background, everyone talks about construction industry and there is always some um, discrepancy around the numbers. Uh, and if you look at the, or the uh, government data, it normally says around 2.2, 2.3 million people work in the construction industry uh, as a whole. And that's really, if you look at the bottom of this chart, um, it's really the bottom three areas. So uh, with, a, with an assembly of workforce, apprenticeship starts, uh, the workforce itself on buildings, infrastructure, and uh, sales and repairs, so with RMI. Uh, it's about the 2.2 million people. But then when you add all of the professional services and other people, it, it increases really to around about 3.5 million people. So by any means, we are not a small uh, sector by government standards. Uh, so just we should always re remember. Uh, breaking it down into, and I, I always go to the, uh, CITB uh, construction skills network analysis, which they do every year. And through my role with the CLC, I've actually uh, influenced what they catch, which is always a good thing. Uh, and then last year's report, which came out uh, March last year, forecast that um, uh, we would increase over the next five years to 2.8, so from 2.2 to 2.8 million people. Um, so for 2.6 uh, to 2.0, I'm getting my numbers mixed up. Uh, what it really means is we, that time we were looking at around about 220, as it says here, 216,800 people, extra people needed in the sector across the, across, uh, the UK. Uh, that doesn't sound much, but it's when you combine that to a couple of towns in Hertfordshire, it's pretty much... Uh, all of the major towns in Hertfordshire as new entrants to the industry. Uh, so that's 43,000 people per year. Uh, if I break that down to London, Great South East, uh, over the five year period, it's 34,000 people looking to deliver around about 6.2 billion pounds to the local economy. So that's Greater London and South East. Uh, so that's about an output growth of 4.6%. Uh, the new figures are going to come out in about a month's time, uh, and that they will show a slight increase uh, to that. Um, what, one of the big areas that we've been looking at with government is on apprenticeships and apprenticeship starts. Uh, and if you look at the years back to 2018-19, which is sort of the benchmark year, uh, we, we had around about 27,000 Apprentices, apprentices starting in the years 1890. Uh, and this chart here just shows a sample of 
what's who started by comparison 1819 from August to November. Uh, and bulk of the starts for the apprentices this is predominantly 16 to 19 year olds. It was 19,000. Uh, so the good news is, is that uh, in 21, 22 this year and last year, uh, Prince of Starts have brought it back on track to hit around about 27,000 people this year. Uh, and you can see the impact of the pandemic, particularly in 2020, 2021, where a lot of people didn't take people up for the nervousness at, uh, during the year, that September intake because of the lockdown. It was pretty much half to what we needed. Um, if I just dwell on those numbers for a second, um, realistically, uh, 30,000 people coming into the industry is not enough. Uh, we've got to be targeting as a minimum 40,000 apprentices and realistically 50,000 to hit the skills challenge that we have today. And if we don't do that, the biggest problem we have, and this is the reason why I personally get involved with this, is that we won't be able to deliver the projects and programs that are on opportunity for us. We will be poaching people from one organization to the next, driving up in, uh, salary inflation. We will become uncompetitive and props, projects will get shelved. Uh, and we have a fantastic opportunity in what we do to really make a difference in the built environment. Um, just delving down into some, some of the stats and uh, you know, for those who may not be familiar with uh, the le various levels uh, of uh, apprenticeships. Level two is very much trade, level three being supervisors, level four moving towards degree um, and uh, um, uh, knowledge workers, level six and seven is at degree standards. And it's really interesting to see some of the stimulus that's beginning to happen it, that uh, we're seeing, uh, if, uh, if I just look at the level two parts of the stats by level, level two, the light blue is the number of people in 18, 19 who joined the industry it was around about nine, nine and a half thousand people at level two, so more craft base, but it's actually increased at level three. And this is some of the drivers, the government interventions uh, and uh, uh, IFATE and DFE interventions where they really want to drive more skilled workforce at level three and above so that it's more of a high, more productivity, higher wage economy. So you can see where some of these stimulus start to begin to happen. And then level four, level five, level six, seven is increasing as well. So the, the, the drive towards greater knowledge workers, which will happen in a in the skills is going to happen, particularly as we drive towards more digital skills and autom autom automation, so robotics and things like that. Um, if I deal with the government policy interventions now, there are a number of interventions that we, through the Construction Leadership Council, CITB, and the various government departments, so we're working with very closely with DFE, Bays, which is the government department that we as construction work into. Um, with DWP, Treasury um, and uh, DLUC. Now, some of these things you won't be familiar with, but are, are worthwhile mentioning. Things like, and it is quite a complex landscape. So if you're not entrenched into this, this can be really confusing. But stimulus around uh, apprenticeship incentive payments. Uh, government put it during um, during the first lockdown, put incentive uh, uh, apprenticeship payments in place of £3,000 per apprentice. Apprentice. So that was just, if you took on apprentice, uh, you were given £3,000 by the government. Um, and that continued to September, and we actually got it extended to Jan end of January this year. Uh, there are huge incentive payments through, if you're involved with the CITB, um, uh, anything from 8500 to uh, 11,500 incentive payments are available. So it's very difficult to say, actually, I can't afford to take on apprentices if you're getting that sort of support. Second thing is, uh, is how do you make sure that uh, when people are employing, employers are employing apprentices, that they don't feel that they're obliged and they're locked into a contract. So things like uh, flexible apprenticeships were, were launched in August this year. 
And this allows people to transfer their apprentices between one organization to the next um, if there is a if there is a need to, to um, allow the percent apprenticeship to continue, but the employer cannot do that. So again, these networks in place, it's really important we understand these so that we can call on the CITB, for example, or DWP or um, DFE to support that. So the, the network's there, and I, as long as you know it, you then got a safety net to uh, allow that apprentice to continue their apprentices. Another big in intervention, I don't know how many people on the call are aware of the apprenticeship levy where anyone over employing 250 people, generally three million pound a year, have to pay uh, of their salary bill uh, half a percent, 0.5 percent of the apprenticeship levy. Now, an organisation like MACE pay around about 1.2 million pounds a year. We do not spend all our levy. So what we, uh, we were able to transfer some of that to SMEs, but actually through having a flexible transfer process, um, we can give more of that to, to our supply chain specifically, uh, where you weren't able to do that before, or give it to other organizations who have a need and, and uh, we're able to place the money and they're able to draw down that money. We're able to support them. Now SMEs can get 90% uh, support anyway through the apprenticeship levy, but actually it's all about the organization support that allows them to develop that. So I'm trying to encourage as many companies as possible who aren't spending their apprenticeship levy to actually look at the pledge process and then get engaged in that process. And so far only 12 companies in the construction sector have done that, but they've gifted over 1.7 million pounds, uh, which will create you know, fairly significant numbers of uh, support in terms of training for any organization wishing to take SME wishing to take on an apprenticeship. Some other interesting developments around T levels, government launched the T levels uh, a few years ago. Now, this is for level three, so it's more supervisor based, not trade based. Um, and in the first wave, there are about 1,200 people involved in that process. That has already doubled in the, third, in the second year. So, good intervention. And this is all about people coming out of FE, uh, going into full-time work-ready uh, employment. So one of the challenges we face as a sector is around about 30,000, 30 to 40,000 people go through FE, full-time FE education a year, but only 25% of them get jobs. Whereas if you go through the apprenticeships, 75% who have started the apprenticeship continue their apprenticeship. So it's completely opposite. It's all about people being work ready. So this is why T levels are really important. And they are developing programs around not just digital and construction, uh, but moving towards design, develop, maintenance, maintenance and repair, uh, and also accountancy and finance. So over the next few years, you'll see more of these T levels uh, and I was a skeptic to begin with, but I'll be quite honest, I am now a fan of T-levels because they allow us to solve the problem of people not getting jobs at the end of full-time education. And anyone looking at that, uh, looking to employ level three, particularly around knowledge workers, uh, technicians, design, digital, accountancy, really should look at this. And then also there's... Um, Great uh, organize, uh, uh, initiatives like the boot camps, which are under the National Skills Fund. So these are 12 to 16 week programs about upskilling people. And this could be really effective for things like uh, developing uh, net zero carbon skills. So um, again, it's a big push around how we drive those. And we're working on wave two, wave three at the moment. Um, and there's around about 900 people a year uh, developing their skills and competency. We need to do more of that. So these are big interventions that we've made with government and it's how we then use that stimulus to help the industry skills plan. Uh, background to the industry skills plan, we actually started looking at this in June 19. We were, read, we were close to launching it in March uh, 2020. And quite frankly, it would have been pointless launching it in March 2020. So we actually sat on this for a year. Uh, it was work done by the, the uh, Construction Leadership Council. It had all of the major trade bodies involved. 
Uh, it had a lot of the larger employers uh, and it was looking at how do we then develop, come up with a cohesive plan to the industry to drive apprenticeships, upskilling, giving us the capability and capacity to deliver the industry needs over the next five years. Uh, and, and, you know, credit to the CITB who, who effectively became the programme managers in helping us pull all this together. Now, the programme had, uh, we designed, not design, had uh, four key pillars, and I'll take you through those pillars now. Uh, the first pillar being very much about improving access and attractiveness to the industry. This is about how do we improve uh, 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 people wanting to come into the industry? How do we drive more people, more diversity? And how do we drive uh, direct employment? And, uh, you know, quite frankly, we do not have, looking forward today, we, we have an opportunity challenge. Uh, I, we need more people than there are people coming into the sector. Uh, and it's about how do we cultivate those people coming into the sector and really driving the skills and capability we need. So we need to do more work. One of the things we said yesterday is do more work at primary and secondary education. So they're ready to take the right, right career choice, right career choices, right choices of uh, learning and development so they can move into the industry smoothly and get the support going forward. And that's why I use T-levels as a prime example. So taking that 16 to 18 development. The second pillar is around about boosting routes into the industry. So how can we do things? So that's why the government interventions around policy interventions uh, really do make changes. Uh, and that's how do we grow the number of apprentices and having the statistics. One of the things that DFE have been doing and IFA have been doing over the last few years, is really giving us the data to make the decisions. Uh, and we've been working hard with them to share that data so we can drive this forward. Uh, not many will know that, that we, you know, as an industry, we are probably the second best payers across all industries behind banking and um, uh, services. So uh, professional services. So construction industry is not a poorly paid industry. And actually the way we are moving towards digital modern methods of construction um, really will start driving the opportunities. Uh, looking at links to FEs, I've given examples of why FEs are really important and why, how T-levels can help that. And also how we look at pathways through higher education. So what we're beginning to do is become much more joined up between government, academia and industry. And, and understanding each of those challenges, how we bring those together and draw those together. And for example, some of the challenges at the moment is FE and HE colleges do not have enough lecturers and they really need support from industry to help them deliver the curriculum uh, that they we are asking for as an industry. Um, the next one is about competencies. Uh, this is a really important pillar and if you look at building safety and uh, what's gone in building safety with the independent safety ISSG uh, I'll have to remember what that acronym is, apologies. But, um, uh, you know, there, there are 10, there are 12 working groups looking at competencies through installers, through professionals, designers, management, et cetera, culture. But these are really important things. And actually using the, using the tragedy of Grenfell in to drive things uh, really important is... Um, uh, could be a huge game changer for the industry. We have far too many occupation standards in our industry. Uh, the hobby horse I always have is dry lining. Why is there three occupation standards? I just want someone to build me a wall tape and joint it and make sure it's, you know, has all the appropriate safety protections in place. We really only need one standard in that area. And this is where we're getting trade bodies, industry uh, organizations and academia working together to develop co new competency assessments and the benefit that will give us is higher productivity, better quality, better safety and it allows us to evolve with um, uh, the modern methods of construction. And then the fourth and final pillar we really focus on is about skills of modernized industry. 
So I spoke about net zero carbon. If you look at the uh, sixth carbon challenge that was issued um, 2020, I think it's certainly early 2020. Um, that was a really interesting document in terms of specifically for construction. And construction could need over the next eight years up to 350,000 more people on top of the 220,000 I've always already mentioned. So there is a huge change about developing people's skills, capability of, of net zero carbon with the assessors, the retrofit, the traditional skills are all going to be needed to up skills as well as the well publicized heat pumps and, uh, uh, and move towards hydrogen. Um, uh, which will develop around 2030. Uh, and then there's new te digital technology around modern methods of construction, digital skills, particularly BIM and how that evolve in the future. So each of these, we have a work stream and really trying to drive these through and, and uh, make sure that both they're, they're understood within their own pillars, but they're also connected and interconnected so we can drive other things. So within the CLC, we have a digital group and we're drawing on the expertise from digital built. Britain, Cambridge Digital Built Britain, so that we can get their knowledge and expertise into our thinking. Uh, and then there's other things that we've put in place. So how it just sort of some of the tools that we we've, we've put in place that people can access and draw upon. And one of the things that we said when we set out with the industry plan, it would be very much driven by coming up with programs that are either established or programs that we want to drive as a single industry solution. So the Fairness, Inclusion and Respect program is a great toolkit developed by CICA uh, in conjunction with CITB. So when we talk about Fairness, Inclusion and Respect and we want to have a program, the point, first point of call should be uh, with what we call FIR program uh, and, uh, and just here you go, FIR program, CITB, you'll get a lot of tools and also those who are CITB members will get subsidies for training. You'll be out claiming your levy back. Go Construct is, a, is about show, but portals trying to bring people in, show them the career, give them the routes, give them the access to employment. And the talent retention scheme came out as it's supported by Bayes, uh, as a 1.2 million pound investment by Bayes uh, to keep people, as many people in the industry. Just for example, we've had over 27,000 people log on to that and look for jobs uh, since the pandemic. If I move on to other initiatives, uh, Talent View is something which has spawned out of uh, talent retention. This is for young people coming into the industry. So uh, this is a little bit old now, this uh, number of companies, but it's well over a thousand companies. We've had over nine. 9,000 people register. So if you if you put your jobs onto the government apprentice website, it automatically pulls into talent view. So anyone's looking to pl place an apprenticeship job should go to talent view. And we will make sure that talent view in time links back into the uh, government apprenticeship website. But equally, um, we want to drive anyone who wants a job in construction looking for apprenticeship to look at talent view. Uh, so this is key thing about a, a driving a diverse talent, you know, women, ethnicity, you know, and uh, and, and a younger workforce because that's what we're going to need going forward. Um, my ask if anyone's on this call and there's nothing like a, there's nothing like a free presentation. Uh, I, I'm also keen about challenging anyone who gets engaged in this process is that look, I understand as well as anyone the challenges and uncertainty of work. Uh, if your pipeline isn't strong or, it's, or you have concerns, then there's always going to be a lack of confidence from employers. But actually, if employers work together uh, and, uh, and understand these challenges uh, and understand what support is available, then we can recruit far, far many more people uh, than we have. And it will help us um, uh, drive up uh, attraction in the industry and, uh, and help us to solve. And, and I use the Kickstart program as a really good example. 
we took a number of people on from kickstart they would never have got through the mace screening process and you know now we're giving them an apprenticeship you know that they are enthusiastic very capable young talent who will be the future of the industry and if we had not invested a small amount of time in understanding that we would not got the benefit of that that cost us nothing uh, and it will give us uh, a huge leap forward in two three years time uh, and the cost of that is very small um, and actually we can create meaningful careers so you know what i'm really looking for is it must have engagement from leadership if we do not have the leadership uh, saying we must invest in young talent to develop and go forward the cost is relatively small when you look at it over a two three year period when you look at the subsidies uh, and the benefits particularly if you are a citb payer uh, then you know use your apprentice levy use the citb subsidies uh, and that's what they're there for they're there to invest in the industry and we should help our supply chain so mace is a tier one i'm always saying we must help our supply chain you know we, it my ask is please share and communicate the material that's available. I know it can be complex, but there is the calling point is always going to be CITB or the government websites or your tier one organization or the tier one organization. Um, the CITB and CLC are here to help. Uh, we want to drive up uh, more, more people into this and give people more time. So uh, Richard, I hope that was useful. I'll stop sharing now. That was really useful. Thank you. Mark. Um, have we got any questions to open up to the floor? Anyone wants to ask any questions on that? I mean, I think my, I, I just start with a kind of brief observation, really. The challenge, I think, for people like me and my organisation is the size of our organisation. And we're relatively small. And it's actually how you actually then develop those links with colleges and universities and things to start to draw in the young people into our businesses. Because if you wait for them to come to the door, they just don't arrive anymore. Those days, I think, are gone. So it's building those relationships, particularly with education, I think is the key to this and underlines a lot of the things you've been saying there, Mark. Um, I think that's key. And I think that's the thing that we've really missed as a joined up industry is how do we, how do we connect in with the colleges, FEHE. So, you know, organisations like BAC, who are these, uh, bring together all the FE colleges. Um, are desperate for employees to get involved and say, how can we take our students into employment? And, and literally, you know, tools like Talent View, it, we need to make that, and by the way, this has only been in place six months. Yeah. So, so it's, um, it's something that we've, we've been, it's been established for a long time. If we can then use, and the CITB, if we can, CITB um, did a brilliant job, for example, placing all of the Carillion uh, apprentices. You know, 80% of those got placed and they, they basically go around and help businesses to take on apprentices or, or graduates for this, this, this uh, matter of fact. So I think the key thing is, is to, to be engaged. If you're looking to take on apprentices, local college, use Talent View, post your uh, position on Talent View and, uh, um, uh, um, networks like this um, just ask around um, we, we really encourage our supply chain and try and support that through our supply chain um, I actually you know there are programs where we're going out to schools uh, and encouraging teachers to, to give us some time to do the career lessons and uh, again that's another um, another important program which has been effective for us uh, uh, I mean, just as an example, and this is not, and again, the reason why I do these calls because I learn as well. Um, you know, we get two and a half thousand applicants into MACE as a minimum before we close our program. And we take on, in terms of graduates and apprentices every year, around about 250. So there's a vast amount of people that we don't absorb, but actually, we could direct them to other organizations. So it's creating that network. And if you, you know, one lesson I've learned in the last 20 months is the power of the network 
is is really really impressive. And uh, you know, the fact that there's twenty odd people on this call um, is a really efficient use of time. So I could connect you with our emerging talent teams, and I could connect you with tens of emerging talent teams. So if you said I've got a role with this, and but actually the place to start is on talent view and places like the CITB. Thank you. Any other questions before we let Mark go? We've got two people with their hands up. Yeah. Got Simon, okay. Celeste and Julie. Okay, so let's go for Celeste. Hi, Mark. Really interesting presentation. I'm about to follow on with my presentation from the mm. university to hopefully fill and address some of the things that you've raised. So brilliant segue into, into me, which was, so thanks for that. That's great. I wanted to just pick up on your point about staffing because I, I really um, am passionate about that and, and listening to you saying actually what HEIs have issue with and colleges indeed is finding teaching staff who are really at the cutting edge of what's going on in industry because that's obviously what what really enhances the teaching um what do you i mean do you have any suggestions or solutions and here's one a little bit controversial to the employers on the on the call what do employers think about uh collaborating with heis and fe colleges to release employees who are often obviously our programs are on day release um so for a 12-week period every friday to come in and contribute um and give something back yeah, well, I, I, that's one of the areas we were talking at length yesterday because the, the problems become far more acute over the last few years so uh, i think we're, be, we're beginning to learn about your issues I, for me i think it's a huge opportunity to um keep some of our elderly statesmen in the business. I've got some, you know, some, and I use that term, elderly statesmen on purpose. They're at the end of their careers. They are really enthusiastic, got fantastic up-to-date knowledge. Um, but actually, and they want to give back, you know, they, are, they generally want to give back. So this is not a hard gig for any, any large organization to say, whether it's in structures, mechanical, electrical, planning, schedule, et cetera. You know, they, they recognize, and, and all big organizations recognize that actually, you know, as part of our overall ESG social value agenda is something that will be beneficial for us. So I, I think we, one thing that we are doing, and it's one of the group's challenge being led by Aled Williams, is how we actually bring people from organizations into colleges and FEs, uh, HEs, um, to drive that forward. So I don't think we've got the answer, but we've got the design, we've got the know-how, we just need to make it happen with a few. Brilliant. Uh, and if there is a way of, um, and Alid looks after that, so um, that was on his agenda, more so yesterday than it was 12 months ago. Fantastic, well, I'll pick up with him then, that'd be great, yeah, yeah smashing. Thanks a lot, Mark, I really appreciate that. Okay, thank you. And then uh, Julie, Carolyn, hi. Do you want to ask a question? Hi, yes. Thank you, Mark. That was um, really encouraging as well with what's happening going forward. I felt um, it's good for us to, to be aware of all what's happening. Um, I was going to pick up on the on the more the young side of things when you mentioned about primary schools and, and getting um, people on board earlier. I think I found from my own experience in the quantities fair. And um, I've offered through the RICS to try and, you know, go back into schools, but there wasn't much promotional things. There was nothing to go in with. Um, I was a governor for six years at my son's school and I worked on their extension building and I spoke with six formers and I actually used their project. But I think if you get the young involved early, I think that's key. I think um, especially with girls, I think um, it's, it's getting them involved, you know, for engineering, architecture. But I was a bit disappointed with the RICS when I went for, for help to try and go. So I don't know if you align with the professional bodies um, on, on those sides as well. I think that will help um, just get it out there more to the younger people earlier is what I think might be key as well, coming up. The yes, 
So in, in the uh, skills plan, that was we we aligned ourselves to what Build UK was doing. And Build UK have a promotional video. Uh, I think it needs updating. You know, you know that was done a couple of years ago. Um, but the, certainly uh, there is programs going out to schools. I mean, there is a, I'm also involved with uh, London First, and they have a network where you can go in and look at, I think there's about 900 schools they're involved with you can actually go to. I think this is something that we need we, we need to work more with with um, DFE, so the construction skills delivery group that I mentioned. Uh, one of the areas there is we're not tackling the primary and secondary school early enough. Um, I think that's key. This is where I, yeah. I, I think we've all agreed that violently. The question is: is how do we engage with those with those uh, with the primary and secondary school? in a way that isn't just about construction. Uh, it's about all industries so that they, they know where to go. So the parents see it as a, a good route into the industry. This is why I, I think we, rather than talking about, you know, we, we start off with showing people on site, but actually that is a, by comparison and the way the industry will change over time, that will become fewer and fewer roles. It will still be, it'll still need 15, uh, 1.5 million in probably 10 years time, but it will be done very differently. And therefore- yeah, The offsite production now and things like that, things are changing. So yeah. each of that's all gonna be very different, isn't it? Yeah, so this is, is, is training the industry for the future and engaging for the industry of the future, not for the industry today. So I do think the promotional materials need to be thinking that five, seven years of what it's going to be rather than it is today. And then if we can then explain that actually it is a, well-paid industry then we can drive that forward so um it, it's on the agenda i think this is a case of how do we make sure we connect and bring everyone together the, the the success we've had in the clc over the last two and a half years has been the the convening power of getting people to work together so i, I think um there is uh, a lot of good work going on and i think if you look at build uk i would encourage build uk one has been the most successful uh, and certainly help with us. That's good. And the other thing is the digital side of things. I think as a construction industry, we've got quite a way to go in terms of catch up um, and things are racing ahead. And just from my own experience, we were working with open space in San Francisco. And it's just, um, obviously you've got very high standards in the UK and that's great, but we just have to be able to work through issues to get things moving more digitally within our processes to help things along going forward, I think. Yeah, yeah. And I, again, I think things are moving on uh, a rapid pace. And uh, again, I think it's about how we present that rather than it, it, and show it to the future, rather than um, show the construction site um, in the cold land bricks is not, you know, that's, that's a relatively small number when you look at the overall the way things are done now. Thank you. Thank you. And then just one final question, uh, perhaps from Simon. I think you've got a hand up as well. I have. Thanks, Richard. Um, yeah, Mark, I echo what everyone else has said. That was really very thought provoking. Um, I'm wondering if, you know, your, your views, I'd be interested to know your views um, in regard to training and development. And you, you've talked about uh, people going one way um, from the construction industry into colleges of, of FE. Um, what about the other way um, in terms of organisations setting up their own training and development departments or, or what have you um, to develop people internally? And I think that you've, you've talked quite a lot about collaboration and I think there's, there's probably some opportunities that way as well. We, we're a relatively small organisation. We, we're, we're sort of 80 people with 52 surveyors. We have 15 people taking advantage of the apprenticeship scheme. Um, so they either go to college at Wolverhampton or um, at um, Westminster. What, one of my frustrations is that we've got a college next door to us um, and literally next door. And we met some of them the other night. And, you know, the, the, the young people there were fantastic, re really up for it, really keen to look at options in the construction industry and I think that there is a there is that lack of awareness um, about what goes on um, 
in, in the construction industry and what opportunities might exist for them beyond being a, a, a bricklayer, a plumber or a, an electrician. So, you know, be, I'd be very interested in your views on, on how we could perhaps address that at a more collaborative level and, and spread that knowledge um, to a wider audience by perhaps doing some more in-house and, and getting them to us rather than us going to them. Yeah, I, I, uh, I do sympathise that. I, and I'm, I'll be honest, we also have a business school where we train a lot of our supply chain. Hmm. That because that's a lot about how to use the management systems that we want to do to, to manage our projects better. Uh, and we train out, you know, we, we put people to our own training. I'm also, uh, uh, I will contradict myself there and say, actually, unless we have a common set of standards, uh, which are of a base level, we're never going to get a common set of standards. And we had the discussion yesterday. Uh, Robert was on the call with me, weren't you, Robert? We had exactly the same conversation yesterday. We did indeed, Mark. About this issue, about how do we get common standards and a, and a level of a base level before you can move on. So, uh, I think if I if I was sort of and this is a contradictory answer, so don't I, I haven't got the immediate answer. So I, I think there is a base level of level one, two, three of any skill that you're always going to be needing. I think there is the next level of boot camps to take you on to the next level. So. If you want to be, if you're trained to be a level, trained as a level two, the boot camps are really effective, short way to get someone from a level two to level three in a short amount of time. There aren't enough of those. And that's where I think industry and colleges can really work together to do that. Um, then, then when you get to the more bespoke, how you do things in your organisation, uh, we will all do that to some extent within our own challenges or initiatives mm -hmm. um, I think sometimes you, you want to widen that within your supply chain so I think there is I would take you on a three-stage approach stage one would be base knowledge which is out there already stage two is about CPD using the systems and tools around them and then level three the next stage and that, that's a Mark Reynolds is not a uh, level one two and three it's it's that next stage is very much bespoke to your business. Um, and, you know, we will all set up courses. I think you've got to be careful not to do much bespoken. Um, one of the hobby horses I have at the moment is we don't train anyone on productivity. So I'm working with a group of private sector clients to develop a productivity training module. But rather than going do it in-house, I've asked the organisation to do it. So it's CITB, it's a CITB approved course. And then as a CITB approved course, it means it's open to many other people. And those who go on that course can draw down a small amount for the levy. Because actually I don't want it to be a MACE or British Land or Sir Robert McAlpine Skanska course. I want it to be an industry course. Sure. So I think that's that's I I'm just trying to think it as as a the industry is an enter, you know an overall um, uh, system and you know not think of it as one organisation just trying to do it itself because a you'll cut costs it'd be much cheaper doing it collaboratively with three or four people mm. it can be shared and and therefore it's something that will allow us to to improve the industry much better and actually it's taken us it's taken me a month longer to do it. So it hasn't taken, as long as you know how to work the system, uh, and that's the challenge is I, I do know how to work the system and I can pick up the phone of the chief execs or the training departments to get things done. Um, and as long as you know who to go through, then you can say, I've got this idea, I'd like to do this, how can I move it on? And there's enough of us now in the network to drive this forward. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Mark. And I'll start. I'll finish how we started. Thank you for coming along this afternoon. It's been really, really good and thought provoking. Excellent. Anything we can do to help, just uh, Richard, drop me an email and uh, I'll, uh, I'll pass it on to someone who's far better. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you.
Okay, and we can now pass on to Celeste Jones from the, uh, I think it's the Executive Director of the University Campus at Auburn's Oakland's College and University of Hertfordshire. I think, is that your title? That was a very long title, but yes, more or less, more or there less. There you go. Um, yeah, I'll, You're welcome. I'll, yeah, thank you very much indeed. And uh, as I said earlier already, it's so nice to have had such a nice segue from Mark <laughs> into uh, into what we're doing to um, to to meet the skills plan. So thank you very much indeed for having me today. So um, as Richard said, I'm Celeste Jones. I'm the director of University Campus St Albans, and I'm going to tell you a bit about what that means uh, in a second. Um, so um, I've introduced myself and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about what UXA is, the University Campus St Albans and what that actually means, because people know of it, some people don't know of it, um, but I think it's useful. I'll tell you a little bit about what, what we're teaching at the moment, what we're doing um, in order to address that skills gap and what courses we have available. Um, and then again, you know, very similar to what Mark said, to talk to you um, as employers and as a network um, uh, and consultants really about how else you can get involved um, with higher education and courses uh, in the construction industry. Um, and then there'll be some time, uh, hopefully, for some questions uh, at the end. And I know my colleague Teddy from Bedford is presenting as well, and we're happy to, uh, happy to sort of go straight into his presentation and do questions at the end, however you, however you want to. I think that's probably a good idea. If we do questions at the end, so we'll just run sure. into the next presentation. Yeah, 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 no problem at all. I don't know if you want to make your slides um, big for the screen, Celeste. Like, oh, am I, in, am I not in, in full, full mode? It, yeah, you've got, we've got your notes on, on there for us all to see. Ah, okay. <laughs> so that's all right. Well, I haven't put anything rude in them. You'll be pleased to hear. Oh, that's, but that's I'm, okay. <laughs> I am so used to working with teams that. Um, Mm, I'm not um, I'm not too familiar with Zoom for functionality. What have I what have you got now? Yeah, we've got the slide and then we've got the next slide. Um, Richard, do you know as a presenter? No, it usually just comes up I in terms don't. of a, Yeah, I'm not familiar with the layout that we've got here. High presenter. Yeah, high presenter uh, uh, from the beginning. At the top of it might be in display settings at the top of your screen Celeste. No I've got everything at the bottom but so slideshow. Slideshow and then I'm stuck now unfortunately because it's saying resume slideshow for zoom. I don't know what that means. Yeah, I, mean, it doesn't, I suppose it doesn't matter too much if you have to yeah get cracking and um, it's a shame though because you're seeing yeah. What are you seeing now? My whole PowerPoint situation. We've got the, yeah, we've got the screen. Oh, gosh. So we can see the, the yeah, it won't let me go back to now. Make, um, start from beginning. So No, it doesn't let me. It just is because you're I'm stuck in uh, in whatever I got came out of. Okay, um, let me let me stop and start again. Not not now, sorry. No. <laughs> and it's half term as well, so I'm just getting... <laughs> right, how are we doing now? Can we see... Um, what no, I can no see? screen up yet, no. Include, oh, resume sharing, I suppose. You start share screen oh, and resume. Dear me. And now I can't even Stop. get into where I was now. Ooh, dearie me. Any joy? No? Can you not see we the screen at all? We can see your screen now. We can see the screen Rachel, still. Well, Rachel, you have the presentation. Do you want to load up and share? As I say, just in case of any technical issues, just jump in and take over. Is that a... okay? Yeah, I can do. Sorry to yeah. Right. Some yeah. Back. Yeah. Sorry, folks. I we uh, Zoom is not our our platform that we we ever ever use. In fact, so uh, 
although I'm very familiar with uh, delivering a presentation in Teams, this has never happened to me before, so I have no idea why. How are we doing? Shall I stop sharing, Rachel, yep. is that helpful? Thank you, that's great. Lovely, that's exactly what I thought I could was doing. That's what I could see my yeah. end anyway. Okay. So, so that's absolutely great. Thank you very okay, much. You'll just have to give me the nod. <laughs> yes, no, no, that's absolutely fine. So next slide then please. And the agenda can we've done already. Um, and who we are is, is about to come up. Lovely. Super. So, yes, OK, that's lovely. Thank you. If you can just keep pressing, that would be grand and I'll, I'll talk through it. So, as I said, we're a joint venture between uh, the University of Hong and Oakland. So put together in 2013 to establish um, what the university and Oakland's considered to be a gap in the market, which was part-time mature students. Um, and when I say mature, um, the average age on our business courses is tends to be in their 30s. The average age on our construction courses tends to be uh, slightly younger. Uh, and I'll explain that about that in a minute. But basically, that is what we do. We're a joint venture. We're 51% owned by the uni, 51% owned by Oaklands. Next tick, please. Um, but what that actually means is that all of our learners are studying University of Hertfordshire degrees on university campus. Um, and next slide. Next tick. But what it means is that we get the best of both worlds. So we get to use the facilities at Oaklands, which is where construction um, has its roots um, in, in the HMC um, and the lower level courses. And then we take the learners on to the university uh, at level six, which tends to work very well. Next, please. Um, and yeah, AXA's USP is the way it works with what's called APEL, which is uh, an accreditation of prior experiential learning, bit of a mouthful. But what that means is that rather than a learner do a traditional four year route or a four year degree, we allow them to accredit their prior experiential learning by reflecting on what they've done. So for construction site managers um, that for some reason may not have gone to university for one reason or another, or have not done prior education, they may have come through trades, for example, and risen into site supervisor or site manager positions. And then the employer now identifies that they would like to formalize that individual's learning, then they are able to APEL and do this fast track piece of work, which enables them to jump in uh, to level five without previous qualifications. Next, please, Rachel. And it was interesting to hear uh, your talk at the AGM about uh, awards. Um, we've just been shortlisted by um, the uh, National Federation of Builders for their construction um, excellence awards for the training initiative. And we also won um, in 2020 uh, as well. So uh, an award winning program. Um, uh, so if you want any, um, any uh, I'm going on the 7th of April to uh, hopefully win. Um, but if you need any uh, info on how that runs, with, uh, with the NFB, I'll certainly uh, can, can input and let you know. Next slide, please. So current progress. So we came in, uh, our first cohort came in Jan 2021. And really interesting to hear um, about the, you know, the CLC report today. But, but it really was identified in 2021 that there was the need for this uh, higher level, higher skills within the construction industry, not moving away from the trades um, and looking at um, digital people management, financial management. So we took our first cohort in Jan 2021. Next slide, please. 
and 17 learners successfully progressed and they were taught uh, in or at home through the pandemic by in fact um, I've, uh, there's, I've just noticed there's two uh, my fellow uh, consultants uh, that work for us are on, on the call today which is great to see and um, due to their hard work 17 of them have sex successfully progressed next please um, and it was also reassuring to hear uh, what Mark had to say about the deficit in the 1920 uh, gap um, for the 2020-2021 apprentices, because, of course, those are the ones coming in to the higher level apprenticeships now. So we are we were expecting 15 to 20. We got seven. It was disappointing. Um, but industry is reassuring us and, and, and letting us know that there are you know signs of recovery um and and quite clearly uh, as mark said and, and it, indeed um colleagues from wilmot dixon have reassured us you know we didn't recruit apprentices to sit in their bedrooms during the pandemic and therefore they are not coming through to the higher level roles now next please but we did have them start and they're now on program for two years next please and we're now recruiting for our Jan 2023 application. So let me tell you a bit more about that programme now. So, um, yep, keep going. You'll need to actually, if you just click all the way through this, Rachel, it'll be easier for you. I'm so sorry about this. OK, so it's a BSc Honours in Construction Site Management, and it can be run as a degree or a degree apprenticeship. So it's a level six qualification, and it um, the, the two routes are very clear. You can either uh, do it as a funded degree and students can get a loan and they can run it the same way that a normal undergraduate students would, or you've heard a lot already this afternoon about levy and levy transfer. So levy paying organisations can fund it as a degree apprenticeship, or indeed SMEs um, with the help of the CITB and levy transfer can get funding in order to do it themselves um, and pay for and support their apprentice. The, the um, apprenticeship, however, then uh, requires 20% off the job. So an employer must be prepared therefore to release their apprentice 20% of their, of their working time. And there are two distinct routes onto that level six qualification. One I've already clarified for you, which is the APEL route. So uh, um, finding a rising star within the business who hasn't necessarily been through formal quals, um, all coming straight through from the HNC, which Oakland's College and, and many other local colleges provide. Next, please. And as I said already, it's day release on Friday. So this is the standard from the Institute of Apprenticeships. I won't dwell on this too much. It does exactly what it says on the tin. The degree is mapped uh, identically to this standard. And that is to ensure that construction project is completed safely within the time frame and, with, and to budget. So you can see that, that, that it, it is a managerial standard um, and the degree is mapped to it. Next, please. So. There's been lots of talk already today, this morning, which is great to hear about MMC, about health and safety, about people, um, and, and right through that CLC report, it was great to hear that the modules that have been put onto this degree and that are mapped to the standard are going some way to address that skill shortage. Um, as I mentioned, I've already that there's a colleague on our course uh, on the call uh, who teaches uh, our, our management modules, and we also work extremely closely with BRE, um, who also teach on the course as well. Um, and, and Dr. Arles is on the call today, so um, he is currently teaching for us uh, on this degree. So that you can see um, how they have a, a clear plan uh, through the course. But year three is particularly focused on the workplace. It's looking at projects within the workplace. It's looking at, at their role um, and it's putting together this portfolio. Next, please. It's all being done and driven towards the endpoint assessment gateway, which is a familiar term for those of you used to working with apprenticeships. And the apprentices, when they qualify, will um, get the construction management BSc honours. They get a graduate degree award level. They take two um, site, uh, certificates, site safety and site environmental awareness. 
Um, they obviously have already done English and Maths, GCSE or Level 2 qual because they're doing a senior high level apprenticeship, a completed portfolio and the whole degree is packaged up and, and accredited by CIOB. So they, they will get their student membership and then their chartership on successful completion. Next, please. So you've already heard um, from Mark how you can get involved, but from UX's point of view and from Oakland's point of view, we're here to help you and support you in any way that you can. What we therefore ask of you is to upskill your workforce, to identify your rising stars. Next slide, please, Rachel, thank you. Oh, sorry, no, just the yeah, app, that's it. Um, so to look at your workforce, identify your rising stars, think about the, the um, people who are on site um, or maybe not on site necessarily, who want to do, you want to uh, do um, one of our management degrees, our business degrees. Um, and think about how you can A, be using your levy, like Mark said, so much unspent levy, or B, transfer your levy to help somebody within your supply chain. Next, thank you. Um, do engage with uh, us on LinkedIn um, and Twitter. It's where I, I go out looking for staff, especially asking for guest speakers, asking for anybody that wants to come and come into the university um, and engage with the modules um, or, or just give something back or do something, uh, introduce their organisation to our to our current apprentices. And if you would like to, we did, we're holding an employer forum on May 2022, so coming up soon. If you would like to link in with me and engage with me on that, be delighted to have you. Again, referring to Mark's presentation, it's absolutely key that, that employers um, and industry practitioners input into curriculum development. That's absolutely uh, fundamental so that we are teaching the right thing to the right people at the right level. And uh, we'll be launching a new initiative, Project Management Level 6, again, levy funded degree apprenticeship. Um, we hope to get the start the development work in um, uh, the autumn, uh, ready for a next year's start. So again, any involvement on that, we're delighted if you want to contribute to a development committee for that. Um, and that's it, that's me. But I won't take any questions now. Excellent. And I, I sincere apologies for <laughs> I can assure you that is not an accurate representation of how we teach online. We're very slick, aren't we, Robin? And Amanda. Uh, thank, <laughs> thank you, Celeste. My um, pleasure. Thank you, Rachel. We were seamless. <laughs> I'll pass over to Teddy. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, hopefully I should be able to share my screen and then start. So show me up, Teddy. Okay, okay. you did very well. Uh, very impressed with your presentation, so well done, Celestine. Um, hopefully everyone can see my slide. Yes, we can. Brilliant, yeah. good. So my name is Teddy Kainyako. I am the head of department for technical and modern courses. I'll explain to you why my title has changed recently as we go along anyway. We have split up construction into two different roles. We realize we need to grow our trades and we also need to grow the technical side. So fortunately, I've been made the head for the technical side, but for today's presentation, I'll touch on the trades and I'll also touch on the technical side because I see these students, I teach them as well. So it shouldn't be a problem at all. Okay, so this PowerPoint, I'll talk a little bit about myself and I'll talk about the Bethel College group as well, courses we have on offer. And then finally, I'll touch on MMC and then hopefully there should be some questions flying in and hopefully I should get the answers for you uh, before we finish with the day. Okay, so just a little bit about myself. Normally I don't talk much about myself, but I'm a veteran. I joined the Army in 2012. Um, I was with the Royal Engineers. So the picture you can see here, far right hand side, this was in Germany in Sinalaga. So there was an old bridge that we had to demolish and reconstruct and which we did within a week or so. So reflecting back on this exercise, we had the skills, we had the knowledge, we had experience that we got through training. So when we go to our unit, we already had the skills required of us. And these are the skills we expect the young professionals to have today. So we, we expect students who finish colleges 
at level three with us or at level four and five to have these set skills. So when they go to the workplace, they can perform. And that is what the Army did. Our, my training in the Army took about two years to complete. Phase one is about 12 weeks to complete. Phase two is the engineer's training. We took about, uh, if I remember, a month and a half to complete. But my phase three is a technical side. That took a whole year to complete. So it's a long uh, way there. Okay. So I left the Army 2016 and joined Bedford College. At the time that I joined Bedford College, I think we already had a, a sister college in Shuttleworth. And but Bedford College has been growing and they formed the Bedford College group as well. And currently we, we also met with Tresham College, uh, which can be seen on my right hand side. We also have the National College for Motorsports and other uh, learning centers as well. So the group is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's very, I'm very proud to be working for this institution. So background knowledge. So this is what we used to do. So we used to have site carpentry. And uh, we used to have paint and decorating as well. We used to have brickwork uh, on this side. There is brickwork on that side. And then this is what I used to teach technical and modern courses, which I still teach anyway. So there's different sets of construction. We have the carpentry, we have brickwork, we have painting decoration, we have technical and modern. Technical and modern is normally to do with courses to do with surveying, civil engineering, site management at level three, level four, and level five. So there's a lot that we do. But recently we've had the T levels as well. So we started the T level just last year. And the T level that I also supervise is to do with the construction design, surveying and planning T level. Currently we have 12 learners on this program, which has been going very well. I think two females and I think 10 males. Uh, but hopefully as time goes, so we're going to, going to be recruiting more females on level three. But the interesting thing that we realize is that we have more females on level four than we do on level three. So we uh, you know that people do have change of mind because construction industry is changing. It is not as scary or as difficult as it used to be. Uh, these days, students can even work or employees can even work in a factory setting. That is when I start talking about the MMC that will, that will bring that one into focus. So we do have more females coming on level four, which we also promote. Then we also have the engineering for construction, plumbing and heating T levels. So basically they are, these are the old courses that we teach, but they've changed into T level. But the question is going to be why T level? I'll just jump onto the slide. So why T level? So the T level, as we all know, is still equivalent to three A levels. However, there's a mandatory 45 day industry placement. With the old B tech or the old qualification we had, you can come to college for two years, work in McDonald's or somewhere else, which is not related to your qualification. And then at the end of the day, still get a qualification from that. And then what we realize is that students go off to university or they go straight into employment and they haven't got an industry skill. So what a T-level is trying to do is to get four students to actually take this work placement. If you haven't done this work placement, you will not get a qualification at the end. So students have the first year to take up some of the work placement. They've got a summer to do that as well. When they come back in the second year, they can do it. The best idea is get these work placements completed before June of your second year. Also, there is an 80% requirement. You would be in the classroom for about 80% of the time, and then you would be in the workplace probably 20% of the time, which is very key. And why do I think the T level is very important? When students go out to workplace, when there's a lot that they learn, punctuality, uh, even politeness, dressing code as well, dress code also changes how to talk to people, because in the workplace, the language you use in the workplace is different. So young professionals start to adapt at a very, very, very early age as well. What we also realize about the T-levels is that it is mandatory, students have to do four external exams. So you have to do four external exams. So you cannot run away from exams with these T-levels. And I've, I know some learners panic about exams, but I've already told them, don't panic about exams. Exams are there for you and it, it, it's going to also mold your future. And why do I mean by that? If you prepare for exams, you start 
to learn something to do with self-reliance. You've got to rely on yourself. How are you going to rely on yourself? You've got to revise. You've got to listen. You've got to pay attention in the classroom. You've got to read around your subject. So as far as I'm concerned, this is will give them a very good platform for the future. They've got a work placement. They've got exams, which will best help them when they go into uh, when they, they go into university because at the university you're expected to be doing exams at the university anyway so they, they get a fill of that okay i'm going to go back to the design and uh, surveying and planning t level so learners who come on this t level by it will take two years for them to complete and they can become civil engineering technician so if you want to be a civil engineering technician probably you want to work on the highways you want to help with construction of a dam construction of a nuclear plant or even working at the airport civil engineering could be your route also we have building control officers which i know are struggling to recruit at the moment so this t-level is also a gateway or a step up for students to become building control officers students can also become technical surveyors they can also become planning assistants and they can become building technicians who could be on site to do with sex inspections and the rest. And the last one is your special technician, which I see to be very, very unique and very, very important. Why? Because everything is becoming digital now. Everything is, is now being stored in the cloud. And this T-level is right because it's going to help students to achieve that. So how are we going to achieve this? We've got work placement. So I wasn't surprised when Mark uh, said uh, Mace is doing everything that he can to help students because currently we have a lady called Anita uh, Patel who is helping our T-level students to do with work placements. And these are the companies we are currently working on to offer work placements for the design and planning T-levels only. This is why I'm in charge, so I know exactly what's going on. Really construction, they, they're constructing one of the warehouses in Milton Keynes, which we visited I think two weeks ago, bam, bam. We have a very good, um, um, we have a very good rapport with bam, and so they also are arranging uh, work placement for us somewhere in the summer. The same thing to do with Morgan Sindel as well. Okay, like Agile Systems, we normally purchase top class souvenir equipments from them, and uh, I think they're going to be uh, presenting to our learners what they do, so students can learn more about souvenir equipment how they operate and all those good stuff. So we know there are professional uh, bodies and we want learners to be ready for the world uh, of work. So what we've tried to do is to get students to register for these professional bodies when they start on the course. And uh, so we've got RICS, we've got CIOB, we've got Royal Institute of uh, Building Architects there as well for them to join. And depending on what pathway the student is trying to go to, they can join these memberships for free. They can then attend meetings online as well if they want to, or where possible, join me when I go for some of these meetings as well. So we encourage students to join professional memberships as well. Um, so recent uh, equipment purchases, we've teamed up with industry experts because we know we will not be able to deliver all these courses all by ourselves. It's not possible to do this. You will not be able to do everything all by yourself. So I know with the T levels, the government was quite generous and, and funded all these equipments. So we've purchased four drones, which is yet to be delivered. We've also purchased a 3D scanner. So I think we have a bit of time. I'm just gonna play this one to see if it's gonna work. Hopefully it's gonna work. And then we take it from there. Should work, should work. So this should take us to COPS uh, website and then that should show us exactly what they do. Oh, strange, strange, strange. If it doesn't, no, it should work. If it doesn't work, it's gonna do something else for it to work. So this is COPS, that is their website. We know we can't do everything all by ourselves. So what they're currently going to do is they're gonna come to our site and train students on how to use these drones. But as I said, We've already purchased four of these drones anyway. So that's something that we're looking for it for students to have a hands-on experience to deal with these drones. Why, why drones? They're, the sort of construction has actually changed. 
construction is changed and it keeps changing. Now we need very young professionals to be flying drones on the construction site on a daily basis. And I think we want to be uh, one of the best colleges that can take a foot forward into making sure students actually take a forefront of this one. The next equipment we're going to look at is to do with the RCC 360 uh, 3D laser scan as well. Why very expensive? I think it costs about 75,000 pounds, but because we are an FE college, we got it a little bit cheaper than that as well. Okay, so I'm just gonna reduce the sound a little bit. It's just to demonstrate what this equipment can do. Okay, um, I'm just gonna forward it. So what the person is just doing is, is just taking data points of this building. That's all it's trying to do now. Okay. So when the data points are captured, probably you can sit in the office somewhere and then create a 3D model of this whole building. And this equipment has already been purchased and it's yet to be delivered as well. So hopefully we should get a delivery. It should be in by probably the middle of March. We should have this equipment in the middle of March. So when it gets to this stage, we are um, very good with Revit, uh, which is a software students have to learn. Students on our T levels currently use Revit as well. So when we capture this data, we can come back to the classroom and then play around with the 3D model, which shouldn't be a problem at all. Okay, back into the PowerPoint. So we, we still have apprentice, apprenticeships on offer. So we still have the surveying technician level three, which is a standard. So if you want to become a surveyor, you can apply to, uh, on level three uh, to become a surveyor, but not every student is able to, uh, at 16, is able to become an apprentice. So the T level route will be better. Or if you want to become a civil engineer, uh, you can also apply at level three. After level three, you can go to level four, apply for the site engineering technician. Or if it's in construction, you can go for construction site provides a higher apprenticeship at level, at level four. The last one I've got here is a level six diploma. Um, that one is for people who have been in industry for a long time and they need that MVQ part. And all they do is they apply to us and then we send our work placement coordinator to get the necessary requirements. So these are other higher education courses that we currently have on offer. We have agency in construction management, HNC in Buildings Engineering Services, HNC in Civil Engineering, and starting this September, we're going to start a BTEC HNC in Quantity Surveying. And we're going to also start another BTEC in Modern Method of Construction, but that is yet to be approved. That is why they didn't put that one here. But the ones you've got here are actually going to run starting this, uh, this, this September. And on level five, we have an HND in Civil Engineering, and an HND in construction management. We haven't got a level six qualification. So we are looking forward to partnering with a local university or any university in UK so that we can run a level six program together. So that is also in the pipeline, something that we are working on as well. Okay, so back to the main bit here. So this is to do with the uh, MMC Center. We, we know when it comes to modern methods of construction, there's 3D volumetric construction, there is cross laminated timber, there's precast foundation, the foundation instead of uh, drilling the hole, pouring the concrete, waiting for a long time for the concrete to set. You can actually design the foundations in the factory and then it's just bring them, transport them to site and then install them and take it from there. And what we were trying to do is to be at the forefront of technology as well. So what we did was we created a center where students can design pa construction panels and then assemble them together. So we have one machine for metal framing and another one for timber. So I won't waste time. I'll play this video online and that would show you around, you know, what to do, enter, and that should work. You can browse YouTube. 
don't know why I have to go through all these just to get this thing to work. Don't know why. Uh, okay, let me try again. Again. That nah, should work. Okay, so this is our center. And which was launched last year. By the time it was launched, I think I had COVID at that time. So I wasn't able to be at the ceremony. How do I hide this thing? So this is Dave Wilkins, he's the director of construction. And this is Ian, Ian is our principal. And this is a level three learner called Adam, Adam Bullock as well. And this is Mac Farmer, I'm here to meet Mac Farmer. Okay, okay. Good, so 24th October, yeah, last day it was. We are very fortunate we had some local employers who joined us as well. Good, good, good. Sita. Passive pepper. Good. That's our structures. And then our own apprenticeship as well, promoting our own. So this is one of the woodwork uh, cross laminated timber machines. So it will do the cutting all by itself. Uh, all you have to do is design, come up with a design and then it will take up the measurements and it will start to do the cutting itself. This is the Howick Framer machine as well. At uh, the time of this video, it wasn't set up properly, but I think we've got it running now. Okay, okay. I think that is the end of this video, I think. That is the end of it. Okay. Uh, hopefully I haven't got more videos. So we're very lucky. We've got a Minister of Skills, Alex uh, Breckhardt, MP. He visited us not long ago. And what I had to do was I had to demonstrate to him how the crushing, uh, crushing of cubes and uh, cubes and bricks work, concrete cubes and bricks work. And he was impressed by that. That is why you can see him smiling uh, with the students. And we all know these days it's very hard for ministers to be smiling because of what's going on. Okay, next one is, I think this is the last one I'll show you. Uh, it's to do with Tecla structures. Again, again, I'm going to do this. So, no, as long as it works, we keep doing it. And yeah, take it from there. This is only two minutes long. Good. So we expect learners to learn how to use the Tecla software as well. So this will be done by learners. So currently I am learning the software every day so that by probably the end of March or middle of March, we can start training learners on how to use the Tecla software as well. So there's a lot we even lecturers have to learn as well. There's a lot we have to learn. So they'll come up with this simple design and then the design can be sent to the machine. So, so Tecla to Havik. So that's what they're doing now. And then it will be sent to the machine and then the steel frames will come up from this. Good, 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 good. And then let us come be able to put all these panels together. They can should be able to put them together. So simple. So we've got a space for this one as well. So hopefully before the end of the year, we are hoping to come up with two projects. Before the end of the year, we're hoping to come up with at least two projects to, so we can showcase to the general public what we've been able to achieve. So just to conclude everything, Bedford College is there so we can provide world-class vocational education, we also provide routes into higher education, equip learners with math and English skills, 
and provide employment opportunities to our local community. I think that is it. Thank you very much. Excellent, Teddy. Thank you very much. Thanks mm -hmm. for your presentation mm -hmm. and thanks for your videos as well. Thank you. Um, and I'll just open up to any questions. Have we got any questions? We've got a few few left. Any questions for anybody? Oh. Look at that. Question three. Oh, good news, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay, let's, well, let's just hope everyone's thinking about who the, who they can send on a course next. Right, exactly. <laughs> That's all we can hope for, isn't it, Teddy? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, so there is there is a hand up, oh, Simon. It's, it, it, it's not a question. It's just a point for for Teddy. I think you know we all know that Senna Lager is probably the worst lager in the world, but I think it looked a little bit better after your bridge. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank okay, you. so if there's no questions, we'll draw it to, to a conclusion. I think, that, you know, going forward, I think it is to build the links mm. between the club and between the various organisations and between the colleges and just to keep talking. Because ultimately, we're all trying to, you know, uh, bring the youngsters forward for our, you know, for my business, for everybody's businesses. I mean, they need to come from somewhere. So if we can help, we will be playing our part in that process. Um, so going forward from the club's perspective, thank you for your speakers. Thanks, Celeste. And thank you, Teddy, for your Pleasure. contribution this afternoon. Um, from our club's perspective, look out for the uh, awards going forward from March. And also our next event is in April. Um, but no, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you, Rachel, for your assistance in all the presentations. And... Thank you very much. See you all again very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.